Welcome to Hash Time with Navguzi Chuanuka. This is a place where we help you unravel social constructs, discuss self-development in line with mental health, emotional well-being, and everything in between that directly or indirectly affects us in the millennial world around us. If you're hearing my voice for the first time and are the kind of person who is not scared of being a better version of yourself even if it requires you to contradict who you were 24 hours ago, consider this your virtual home. I'm your host, Navguzi Chuanuka, and I cannot wait to engage with you in the various conversations. This 100th episode is one of its kind. In it, I bring you a summary of the podcast live recording event we had on Women's Day. The event was, or still is, one of the efforts made to make sure that women's voices are amplified on online spaces. If it wasn't for MCI Radio, you wouldn't have an idea of what transpired that day. So, thanks to the team's effort that this comes to you as the 100th episode. Let's dive into it. Yeah, naturally, I'm a really shy person, in person. When I'm behind, when when I'm in studio, one-on-one guests, ah, I'm very okay, very confident. I make noise, but being here now, hi. (laughs) So welcome to How Digitally Fit Are You? I shared the idea with most of the people that got the invite digitally and concepts that have been shared online, that is on my online platforms. My name, for those that have never seen me, my name is Navguzi Chuanuka and I'm the podcast host of Hash Time with Navguzi Chuanuka. On the platform, we normalize conversations related to mental health and everything related to those things that may make it hard for a millennial to thrive in life. So we have those conversations there. We have them with Ugandans, Kenyans, and every other person, as long as it's an African, because we want to make this a normal thing on the continent. So today we're going to be in line with the Women's Day theme, that is Digital, and it's related to making innovation and technology as a tool to make gender equality achievable. So on the panel, we're having Bobina Zofa from Policy. These people really sponsored this event. They have made it possible (laughs) for us to be here. MCI also made it very possible. This is where we are. MCI Radio is also here with us and they are streaming us live to various people that are listening in to the radio. So what we are going to do is we we shall have the other panelists join us a little later. He's held up, but we're going to start with Bobby now who is available and uh, she can introduce herself. I'm seeing her for the very first time, so she can introduce herself. She's going to tell us about what policy is after and we shall start the conversation from there. Hi everyone, I'm called Bobina, Bobina Zofa, and I'm a data and digital rights researcher at Policy. Policy is a civic technology organization where based in Kampala and Bugolobi, but we work across much of the sub-Saharan, but also global south, really. And I'd say our biggest offering is uh, the research that we do uh, at the intersection of data, tech, and society. And a lot of that research is translated into, you know, programs and advocacy programs, mostly, with our feminist movement building team who have made this happen. Yeah, that's uh, just a really a brief overview of myself and the work that I do with policy and what policy is doing, but I am happy to share more around the work we're doing in relation to the overall theme. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's after. Thank you so much. So what we are doing today, when you talk about digital, we are making sure that everyone, regardless of their agenda, they can access these digital platforms. And the main thing that we are going to be talking about today is how online gender best violence makes this hard. So we're going to hear from Bobina. When we talk about online gender-based violence, there are some people we know, when you looked at the form, there are some people that had no single idea of what that is. And yet these are things that happen day in, day out. So would you highlight that bit for us on online gender-based violence and also probably why you feel like people might not have an awareness of what it is, yet it's very common. So as policy, I'd say we've done enough work around online gender-based violence across uh, a number of countries, both Francophone and Anglophone here in Africa. And I just want to very quickly mention from like the larger theme, which is innovation, tech, and gender equality. I'd say as policy, we basically working at the intersection of 
tech and data and society a lot of what we do really does look at the impact of you know the different innovations that are coming up it could be the internet it could be social media it could be ai systems we're really looking at the tech innovation space as a whole and we're more focused with the digital rights part of that so what's the impact of these technologies particularly on african women being a african civic technology a feminist collective as well we use feminist theories to dissect these issues and try to make sense of them and try to come up with a number of recommendations so just moving to the online gender based violence as a thing itself uh, my colleague bonita nyamere i don't know if some of you know her has done a lot of work around this she has been leading much of our research around the area of online gender based violence uh, with our most recent report being uh, a report called a dark place for women journalists so i'd say like in very simple terms just think about um, i would assume everyone in this room or listeners uh, of the podcast know what you know gender based violence is you know which is violence which could be sexual or physical or any sort of violence that uh, women get to face in the physical world so what we see is this is now happening in the virtual space as well on the digital spaces and so in very simple terms that is what online gender based violence is you know uh, women facing this violence on online spaces and i don't know if you want me to just go a little past that i just wanted to quickly point out that this violence takes the form of it could be misogynistic hate speech it could be sexist comments body shaming you know and this extends sometimes as we see from even the online spaces to the offline spaces where you know some people's families and friends you know end up getting attacked from comments that they were initially receiving from online and they're tr- translated to the physical spaces as well of their lives so i'd say like that's sort of an overview of what online gender based violence is and I'd, i'd say in africa here from the research that we've done the people that are facing this the most are women journalists women human rights defenders and politicians compared to you know other groups of people but those are people that are really getting you know the the worst of it in online spaces when yep. you mention the part where they are the most targeted i i think it's important for us to also highlight what the cause might be is it because they are easily accessed or are they putting themselves so much out there as opposed to someone who might really be at the back end you know someone who is just like i, I would say a visitor online they are very occasional um definitely but i think again like i said uh, using the feminist theories one of the things that we found is generally from what was happening in the physical world or what continues to happen today is women predominantly have been told to live in the private spaces and men live in the public space it's it's their world really so as a woman coming into a public space it's already cause for you know expect whatever is coming your way just because you're a woman and you're breaking out of a space that society has built for you and that has to do with the patriarchal system that we live in today because it's you know it's been constructed that way so i would say that's one of the reasons that we see that happening on online spaces as well because the online space has something that started out as something that was meant to be a democratic space a space for everyone to you know come and freely express themselves and now we see what was happening on the offline world being translated into the virtual world as well where now again uh the virtual is a male space and women come into the spaces like how dare you you're breaking the norm so it has to do with the culture norm our perceptions of these spaces you know that we occupy as men and women very much so but there is of course a number of other reasons you know it's what why you why you talking politics as a woman if i feel uh, negatively about your opinions as a woman you're most likely to get like all this i mean it's not to say that the other gender or the other genders are not getting this backlash for their opinions they still are but we see that online gender based violence is much more skewed towards women than men and the data is there to support that it's very important that you've highlighted the bit of the other gender also facing that rough patch and it reminded me of someone that I was having a conversation with prior to today and he said that he was managing a politician's social media i think twitter and the messages that were coming in the inbox he couldn't believe it he was like yo women face this so i think it's very important that you highlighted that bit where yes it happens both sides but the women get it more so can we hear from mr bus <laughs> You missed out on the introduction so it's important for the people to know that you're one of the panelists. I am. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, hello everyone. What are you doing? Welcome. My name is Abbas Mpindi. I work here at MCI. I am the CEO. 
It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thanks for hosting me. Sure. Thank you for honoring the invite. At least talk about what MCI What MCI does? Uh-huh. Okay. For um, people to have an idea because some are here for the first time. Yes. So uh, our work is um, essentially training young journalists. We say we're building the next generation of journalists. That's the buzzword. Uh, we started by just organizing competitions and bringing young journalists closer to opportunities. And now we have transitioned to creating a space that allows, you know, amplify media innovations. In essence, the work hasn't changed. We still train and work with young journalists, only that now the idea of creating a space for innovators in the media landscape uh, is an addition. So, yeah. I am one of those innovators, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was privileged to be one of the people that were pioneers of the podcast training under MCI, so truly honored to be here. So, best on what Bobina shared, I don't know if you had, but at, at some point when you were around, <laughs> at some point when you were around, she highlighted the bit of journalists being a target the main target when it comes to women. Yes, online gender-based violence happens to other people, but then there are specific groups of women that are targeted, and journalists are one of those that have been trained. Is there something, when it comes to the training, is this something that you've considered when training the young journalists? So the role of journalism in, in this space and in this conversation is really, really important. Uh, and first of all, it's, uh, it's to look at how journalists are in themselves covering these issues. But the first thing to talk about, like, how are journalists being attacked? So not just online, but even in their newsrooms. So, and those attacks could be, you know, emotional attacks on someone's capacity to produce or to work because they are a woman. Or it could be, you know, sexual harassment in the newsroom and online as well. So we know as an organization that works with young people that people come back and say, you know what, I would have loved to stay in the media, but it's not for me. And it's painful to see someone who had the passion to work in the media, to tell stories, say they would rather now go into communication and the reasons are things that could be avoided, but it's hard because some of it, like she was saying, is really intrinsic into how people behave and, and, and you know, the traditions of a patriarchal society. Yeah. So is there a moment in your trainings or even the journalists that you have, have you had that, those kinds of reports to you before? So for our training, we have safety and security for journalists. And it just targets every aspect of how, what do you need as a journalist to be safe, whether you're you know, a man or woman. But of course, what we also have added now is a component of mentorship. And we have a lot of female mentors who go through these experiences and are able to talk to the young journalist and say, this is the field you're coming in and this is how things look like and the support system you need in place. I was in Kenya, one of the things that we're trying to um, teach now is the idea of, you know, promoting leadership, newsroom leadership um, for women and as an organization again which is like a whole lot of male led, we are asking ourselves <laughs> if we're the right people to do it maybe partnerships with other organizations that are working on that but newsroom leaders who are women play a crucial role in terms of mentoring the next generation of women leaders in the newsroom, creating an environment within the newsroom that allows you know, um, women to thrive and also putting in place online either policies or platforms that safeguard. Um, we hope that it goes through. But we also do gender sensitive reporting training with other partners for journalists to learn how to one report about the importance and, and relevance of things like gender equality. Um, our fellowship is not is not just media and skills training. It has a big component on social justice journalism and leadership for journalists. And that includes you know, round table conversations between male and female fellows about the stereotypes. So we have a, an exercise where 
you talk about the stereotypes you hear and we are able to really debunk them and see most of the young even young men in the fellowship by the time they leave the fellowship their mindset and their thinking which was previously probably very traditional begins to be challenged and then also for the space the young women are also to be able to you know speak up and say oh all along that's what you were doing yeah so those are some of the ideas we you know ways we try to make sure that it's the conversations are ongoing yeah thank you so much back to bobina when you talked about the patriarchal system being one of the reasons that you know keep this ground very fertile for online based gender violence what are the specific ways you feel like a woman when it comes to online gender based violence how best can they protect themselves okay um I'm probably not the best person to talk about this because I'm not a cyber security expert but I do know from some of the trainings we do at policy or from some of our recommendations in the research reports we put out um, along gender based violence I think we try to like map out a uh, sort of multi stakeholder approach to this because there is like no one group that can just dismantle this system that has been in place for so long so there is different roles to be played by different people or stakeholders so of course as a as an individual say being a woman journalist it serves you to have the capacity to be able to protect yourself online so that comes with the digital security training i mean he mentioned how they're doing some of that i know a lot of newsrooms right now are doing i know with the future of work project with the a lot of the people we've been partnering with that's been a big element uh, cyber security training where they told about all these you know uh, the passwords this and that you know block and all these you know like i said i'm the expert but there is like a whole range of you know the cyber security how to you know protect yourself as a person online but there is also a role to play um again like he mentioned like even within the newsrooms so as the news editors or as the news house is there a sort of policy brief in house policy brief that uh, addresses these issues where you know it's something that's known to the journalists so it's something they look out to uh, i could be government you know are they able to uphold the policies that are supposed to protect women on online spaces because it's their digital rights for them to not be silenced and thrive on online spaces um is it the tech companies big tech do they have a role to play in the misinformation disinformation malinformation they have a role to play as well in whether it's regulation and coming in to address where cyber harassment is happening on a large scale or something towards groups of women or something so i think there is something to be done at different levels and i think that's one of the best ways it could be approached really yep Yeah. And uh, what interested me most when it came to policy is when I found the digital safety. I don't know if are we all connected to the internet? Do you have internet activated on your phone? Could you take us through the digital safety platform? Um Julie. I think she's <laughs> the best suited to do that. <laughs> yeah. That's supposed to be in the background. Why are you bombarding me? Hi everyone. Uh, so the name is Juliet Chris. I work at Policy as the community engagement lead. So we've created a game online because we understand that like Bobina has been saying we do a lot of research but this interpretation of this research for different audiences it's different. So you put out a research concept and like but you don't understand the language in which your research has been put out but also I think for us what we are doing with our research is we try to visualize it and the digital safety game is one of the ways through which we've actually visualized our research. So when you go online just type in digital safety safe the word safe and then t chikachai that word so you can play that game at your own time and there are characters that we've developed that when you can choose a character that you can play as in that game and that different prompts through that game that will lead you to a different level so if we are speaking about uh abas have you found it yeah have we found it Okay. Uh so when you go to the game like you choose a character, I think there is a Muslim lady who I love. So you choose a character that you want to be and then there are prompts. So at different stages of the game, the prompts will sort of ask questions. So if you're online, how do you respond to an incident of harassment such and such manners? It's so it's a user-friendly game if I might simply put. So again, research simplify it in a manner that if it's prompts whoever is 
a part of these prompts is able to sort of find themselves within the game but you're playing the game you're enjoying it but then you're also learning about a topic that you might not be paying attention to previously thanks for bombarding me welcome <laughs> she just said you're welcome <laughs> So you can do that probably you'll be doing that in the network session. I would like to pass the microphone to the audience and uh, if anyone has a question to the panelists so that they can answer these questions. Uh thank you so much. But one of the panelists mentioned that they use feminist theories. Do you, would you mind telling us which ones exactly? Because we have the Afrocentric and the Eurocentric. Where do they meet and where do they merge? Do they speak to the Ugandan experience? Very happy to take that question. So, being a Ugandan I'd say homegrown civic tech. A lot of the work we do is Afrofeminist in nature. So I'd say we draw a lot of our theories from Sylvia Tamale's work, who's Ugandan. So a lot of our theories speak to the realities of African women, of Ugandan women. Yeah. My interpretation of the digital world is it's a virtual space where there are not so many rules and where people can say anything and get away with it where anybody can put a face to anything and you know so it's hard to have checks and balances so for somebody who is online in a world that is virtual and not really censored how do you really protect yourself whether as a woman or as a man because if for example you put something online it could be a happy moment and then people will come in and it ends up affecting your mental health one comment like this can really almost lead you to suicide sometimes so how best do you think you can really guard yourself given the nature of the online world I'll, I'll, I'll just say something very small and pass it over because I'm sure he has more to say about this. But I'd say like I do get the feeling of you know from your description you know the internet or this uh, virtual space feels like some wild world west with no rules and whatnot. Yeah. But in essence, I'd, I'd say from like maybe the beginning of a lot of say social media at the time, there's been very limited regulation. But I personally believe greatest change can come from system changes if the overall system changes from what it is right now so it's the different people that i talked about that have a different role to play to alter this system and this is something that is you know it i, I feel like in many ways we're sort of playing catch up for example with regulation of technologies tech policy tech policy is very slow you're seeing with a lot of emerging technologies we're just playing catch up but i don't know i don't personally like the response of be a more resilient person but Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, it's like, if, so for example, with the program that we've been doing with the, a number of, I think, women leaders, MPs and whatnot, uh, I think one of the things is that came from the Amplified Report abuse we did on politicians uh, around the election in 20. 21 was these people are being you know abused and a lot of them went silent they got off these social media platforms but then it's like well it works against you to be offline because as a woman politician you might as well be on this space because it serves you to put yourself out people to get to know your ethos what what I, what what is it you're trying to do for them so it's a disservice to be silenced so it's like maybe sometimes it's like well try and be resilient but I, I personally don't like that response that's why I personally would like the it seems like a slower process but system changes I, I believe uh, would be the most efficient in just addressing this entire system that's sort of a mess right now yeah. so you know this Ghanaian song I think says if anyone is stressed this year I will delete them and, <laughs> and, and block them <laughs> yes so me, I go for that radical part of like block, delete. But the, the I think there are different levels. There are people who are big tech that are doing the work. And I think policy is also doing the work of training people and that exposing them to different tools to protect themselves. Um, digital safety, like that one. Please uh, access it and use it uh, so that you can know like how do you create all these you know passwords and, and things like that. I set a limit for myself in terms of, uh, for example, from a news consumption, if I start from there, I know what, like, during the COVID lockdown or 19, that was just a lot for people taking, and we are saying, please have a li news consumption limit, right? So that if you watch TV for a specific period of time, and know, like, you know what, I've just been seeing dead bodies, and now, like, 
you know numbers of people um and it's affecting you and it's the same with uh, social media the thing that recently i was looking at my phone now can give me I guess maybe it's a cool phone but the phones now can give you <laughs> like the number of hours you've spent on different platforms so and i was looking at the number of hours i spent on whatsapp to be honest and it looked like i've not been working at all it's like 26 hours in a, in a week and it could be that i'm working right but that time that you spend there is also the time that exposes you to different you know online you know c- c- people are talking about click bites who is sending you what kind of of information um so i know my limit in terms of consumption then even on 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 the different platforms for you knowing are you an influencer yeah if you're not an influencer then <laughs> Because sometimes there are people that send you requests to be honest and you've never met, right? And you know this is not going to end well. And of course, there are all these privacy tools on the different social media platforms that you can go into to safeguard yourself from receiving certain information from people you don't know, from having certain comments on your photos. And because there are people that you want to even just reshare their post and you can't because they've put those privacy settings i mean those are really basic um the guys that policy have more intricate tools that you can um use or go into and if the worst gets to the worst don't be resilient <laughs> just take a social media break the best time i've enjoyed sometimes is when i've lost my phone and uh, at the beginning it's like too much to be there without a phone but then you realize after if you spent a week without a phone there's some sort of going back to old school right that you are just you're okay right so maybe you need that as well so that you don't have to be online all the time if it's getting there yeah mine are not really technical they're just simple tools Now that you ask whether she was an influencer had I been the person to ask what advice do you give me Are you an influencer? I am what are you talking about <laughs> yeah. uh, influencers I think you still have uh, tools to I think they are now even language filters where you can say okay this is comments that should not come to my inbox So I think for me those are really basic in terms of privacy settings but I don't think that's pretty enough for you as an influencer because you every day if you have followers you're always adding numbers 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 uh maybe you need her advice of resilience <laughs> 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 to build your you know your one of the other things what for me I I like to do digital literacy for at at least to have conversations with other people you know as a man to have conversation with you know other men young men that I, we mentor here because the tools they are using them and maybe whatever they are doing in those inboxes and and comments maybe they are not aware where it comes from right and so we are not talking about what they are sending we are talking about like what gets you to behave like that right and i realize there are tools online but there's also let's go back old school and create spaces where we can have conversations of why we should be just good human beings right um when i was starting my career we used to go to the universities and like even high school to train people about making smart choices and some of the conversations really had to do with all these things but at the end of the day we do the things we do because there's a certain way we are behaving online and it's the same way we behave in physical spaces if i can on a virtual platform make sexist comments it's very clear that even in daily life i will do it i'm not hiding there are some people who will hide behind other faces or other you know other um handles that are not theirs especially if they want to attack someone and they don't want to, like anonymous but if that person is doing it online they definitely do it in real life and what we've lost is continuous engagement in physical spaces to challenge each other and to be able to say because when we talk about fake news and how to stop it and we tell people before you click or share please think three steps but in real life <laughs> we also tell people filter right filter just just think about it just think about it before you actually speak something that you know will be insulting or 
dangerous to the other person. And for me, it's just the humanity that we need to be able to bring from physical spaces to bring it online. So it can be policy work, just it can't be MCI work, even organizations that are working on daily working with young men and young women. These conversations need to happen because there is nothing that is virtual that is not happening in the physical spaces. If a woman puts, you know, they are at the swimming pool and they maybe post a picture when they are swimming or at the beach, if I can comment sexist comment there, it means if I was at Gaba Beach, I would do the same, right? It hasn't changed really. I didn't give you the influencer response. <laughs> Be resilient. <laughs> As an influencer, I think you need more. I think influencers need really more digital safety and security training. And you should invest more money into not getting the basic toolkits that we get, but real hardcore trainings, because that's where you are earning money. That's where you spend like almost, you know, your whole life there in that space. And that's like, it's like if I wasn't, this is my influencer space, right? If I wasn't keeping this, I do each and every day an extra step to make sure it's safe for me and for everyone else. So I think influence the same way. So when we talk about people that are working online, you realize that some online spaces or virtual spaces become property or digital spaces become property to some individuals. And when Abbas was speaking, I remembered a Kenyan lady who had a YouTube channel with so many followers. And the moment, I don't know if the boyfriend had her password, but when they broke up, he deleted all the content. And she could no longer access the platform. So she had to start afresh. And that for me, I, I think when I see some of these people talking about sharing, you have to share passwords <laughs> and things like that. And I remember I had to think about the podcast that I have. And I was like, hey, <laughs> no one is supposed to have anything related to my work or even my platforms because now my social media may not just be for fun or anything. There is more to it that happens. So to add on to what they have mentioned, personally, what I do is just keep in check of, I, I might not have control of the people coming to my space because sometimes come through some people come through the podcast or someone has shared something about you but it's also important to check the people that send your friend requests sometimes i don't have time it takes a lot of energy to study every other person's account now when someone sends me a friend request they don't have a profile picture or they don't have a real identity they they have locked their profile and what do you mean i don't know you you'll block your account how am i supposed to assess you we need to start assessing people before allowing them into the spaces. Because if you're talking about, even like he's mentioned, huh? even names. You've, I, I, there's some people in my, that I wanted to even highlight on my friend list. Like, you guys are so lucky to be in my space because you don't have real names. <laughs> because I don't do that. I want a real name. Someone sends you a friend request and they're bidi abidi mwa abidi. Over <laughs> you know, and so how am I going to respond? You, you're going to comment on my post, and I'm going to say It doesn't make sense for me because when I relate with people online, I want to relate with them the way I relate with them in real life. There are people that say, "I don't take social media serious," but some people live their lives there. So do everything that you need to take care of your spaces. You own a business online. Please use policies. Digital safety is going to share with you insights on how to protect yourself online. Hello. Thank you for the knowledge you've given us so far. My question is regards to research. You talked about politicians and uh, media personalities. However, with the way that technology has impacted the society and uh, you have kids and school-going children, 
with on social media in your research do you do such research when it comes to schools and the impact of online gender based violence in schools and what has been your finding in regards to that um that's a very interesting question so we do not have something published yet on that but we've done work on minors we have a report in the works called Gen Z where we look at the internet usage patterns of the so called digital natives the young people born in the digital era so from the research we have so far yes they do experience a lot of online gender based violence a lot of them have you know talked about the same things that have been happening the the negative comments the sexist comments and what not so we haven't because we don't have the work ready to get out to the public uh i can't quantify it for you and tell you it's a bigger problem than say for example for human rights defenders or for journalists but it's an equally bigger problem for that especially being people who are constantly on online spaces even way more than the older people especially here across the continent from the at least data we have it is a problem the miners are complaining about it as well uh maybe to just add on that we have a program here called media literacy for kids um and tracy and other people here are trainers and the the rationale was to train kids between i think 5 5 7 and then 10 to 12 or 10 to 14 how the media works right and when we talk about media we didn't um say journalism we talked about you know how is media created who is behind you know movies you watch what do you see online so we do have here at MCI a curriculum to train parents teachers and kids themselves and then we had an event here where one person who works with the the children's authority i think if i remember very well and they have all these cases of kids teenage girls or kids who are befriended by old men online so there's this one case this person pretended to be a young and it's like age mate and they were chatting for a very long time and so this girl maybe thinks oh this is a cool person and then they invite this guy to the home this guy abducts this kid but it all started on facebook so there was a whole how people are using online platforms especially to you know kidnap children and as you know for sure a lot of our siblings young they already on facebook right they have access to these platforms so there is also need and i'm glad you guys are doing this there's need to equip that generation as well with uh, that awareness right because people just reach out and make all these promises and they turn out to be an old person an old man trying to and it's a it's i didn't want to finish the story but it's a it has a nasty ending and after that story everyone was like well things are really bad again like i said the same people that would do that in real life would do the same online so You know when you mentioned the part of the children being kidnapped even adults you need to take precautions when dealing with people, especially people that you don't know people see you online and instantly they feel like they own you DMs are dangerous man <laughs> there's a person who texted me towards midnight and I was like oh the audacity yeah and then <laughs> so I opened the message and ignored it like just show him yeah I've seen the message but I'm not responding. Then early in the morning he sent another message. He was like come on don't be mean. I'm just a fan. Let me give you time maybe you're busy. I archived the chat and silenced it. I'm not going to be notified when he texts or some I I do them a favor. I help them not to feel like I'm rude or not to feel attacked. I help them by blocking them in Messenger so that you can't text me anymore. People just want to own you. They don't know you, but they're going to own you. So, in every way, don't leave these spaces. You need to be in on you need to be on these digital platforms. So, the majority of the Q&A session was edited out because the conversation kind of veered off the day's theme. What you need to understand is that you all human beings you have biases and as we have our biases those biases can creep into our stories especially if we are writers we are communicators so you can tell certain biases in what story you're reading so you're saying some stories are subjective right there's a reason why you're saying that because you've sensed a certain tone you've sensed a certain maybe uh bias right and it's not just on covering that line of stories it's just across so you can tell uh you can tell who has gender bias if that 
person has a bias on women and the stories they tell. So journalists are trained to make sure that, you know, if you're covering now, there's a big emphasis on making sure that you have, you know, women experts in your story. Because in most of the stories you read or see, the experts are always men. So, so yeah? He's, and when it comes to the victim, so it's, and it's just the, it's very natural for a, a, a male journalist or even a female journalist to be at a source, as a space where there is, maybe, you know, you can get a voice of the expert and also the, the voice of someone in the community. So there is always high chances that you will find voice of someone who has struggled, you go for the woman, of course, depending on the context. It also has to do with the whole, you know, s- structure of, of the, the economy. Who is employed where? Once you asked for, we want experts on climate change, there's probably going to be a hundred men who are over there. So Andrew won't have a choice, but to interview those guys. But Andrew could do an extra, you know, to say, but okay, it's a hundred men, but there must be someone, right? And maybe there's, you know, that woman that someone didn't know about because we have not been documenting them over the years. And the reason why we have all these men is because we've documented them many, many years and so they are known. So the other people that we say, oh, they are not there, they are there, but we've never focused on them. And if we put them up there, so it's the same. So you'll see those biases. So you, we, I can tell if you have a bias against, let's say, a certain tribe by the way you present, the way you talk about them, if you're on radio, on TV. So the biases are there. That's why you're saying it's subjective. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. Hello. Hey, hi. Uh, my name is Andrew Kagwamaiga. Um, hi, Andrew. Hi. <laughs> I'm a journalist. One about the whole subject, because it's not the very first thing I wanted to talk about, but uh, I've been lucky enough to work under female editors my entire life. And uh, it has always been very deliberate that you need a female voice when you're putting together a story. And uh, I hate sharing this story, but it's something that happened. There was that whole saga when people wanted to demolish the National Theatre. I'm an arts and culture reporter. Which, which, which? So there was a time they wanted to either demolish, redevelop. They were using very many terms that were very unclear. So I was very vocal online about the whole thing. We started a campaign where we printed a couple of t-shirts of uh, Save the National Theatre and everything. So the minister that time was... Uh, the Minister of uh, Gender, cause art and culture, uh, simply under that. It's not really a department, it's a desk. So, like, I shared you an interview with her, and then she first hesitates to give it a yes, but then eventually says yes. So I turn up for this interview, and uh, I'm ready to fire away, and she's like, oh, first wait. And in no time, like, men come and now sit around her. That one of them was, I think, big and other men I didn't know much about. So I start asking her questions, and whenever I would ask a question, like, they would bounce it off each other, and then by the time it gets to her, it's either useless. So I noticed that she was technically avoiding to be the source by fronting these men. So I started firing the men direct, and I remember the end of that whole interview was when it was like, so do you still stay in Pedere? And, well, that threw me off. <laughs> that interview never ran, like it didn't run, because after that, everything about that interview went upside down. But... My point is, at times, actually, people try their level best to include everyone when they are interviewing. But you're going to find someone that will be like, uh, "I need you to withhold everything I told you. I don't know if my husband will be okay with this coming out." Okay. Uh, last question to Mrs. Uh, Bobina. I wanted to know. 
Okay, Miss, you can Miss. just call me Bobina. Yep. Okay, Bobina. Okay. I want to know there is an issue arising when it comes to property, especially in marriages, and uh, such things escalate into onto online social media. And um, in your, have you done research in line with that? How property is affecting online gender-based violence? In a way, um, no, it's not something I can speak to. I we have done work on online gender-based violence as a whole, so there is a number of things that come up as core themes. So, for example, gender is one of the things that starts um, a lot of online gender-based violence. The conversation around gender itself, politics, etc. But I, well, that's interesting. I didn't know about. I mean, I I see that on online spaces, but I didn't know it was uh, or like to what an extent to what extent it's a problem. So I can't, I can't really speak to that. I, I, so we focus a lot on the data uh, element of how that's impacting societies. But yeah, I... Uh, good afternoon to you all. I must say that they have a program which can help the young ones with the media. But then when I look at it, there are some of us who have just dived in because it wasn't our thing, we have just entered into your era. Then there are some others who are in your age, but they are in between there. You can find somebody who doesn't even know how to write, but she has a digital, and she doesn't know how to manage it. And whatever she shares, it's not easy for her or him to filter. Then when you come to organizations, many of us are using digital either in our kind of work, either looking for jobs, um, not from the journalist side, but then there are things you look at and you see that this is a person, I think, who really doesn't know much about the digital. So I'm wondering with the policy, is there in any way how you can help certain organizations if they happen to contact you? Because me, I'm working with a research organization, but yeah, we seem to be a lead, but when you're going to dig it all, you find like we are half-baked. So I don't know how we can be helped. Then to as mothers or grandmothers, many of us may be having those young ones. How can we approach you so that those young ones are helped? As the lawyer said, many of them have been victimized. TikTok is the way. Once you see a WhatsApp, just know TikTok is on the way. It's already there. It's already there. Facebook is already there. It's not easy these days for a child or an adolescent of these days to talk about any program on the TV because it's not their thing now. They would rather close themselves in the bedroom and they are on the phone throughout. So I'm just wondering how can the children and the, can I call them innocent adults or green adults be helped? Thank you very much. Okay, so for, I'll start with green adults. Uh, so we have, a, we have a media training program for NGOs and uh, the, the capacity building around it is how to communicate and tell your story better. So we will bring your team, take you to our studios, and um, ask you to tell your story about your work and your organization. And we'll have your team listen in and watch you. And then when we're done recording, we'll play it for you. The thing is to understand how to communicate and tell your story so that the people understand it better. But for that audience also, there is, you know, we have a digital skills training, especially based on the needs of the organization. So if you say social media tools and how to use it for your work. So that can be done at institutional level. So we do those trainings. Um, I don't know if there is anyone who has the power right now to fight TikTok, to be honest. It's scary because... Uh, it's just even the sound of TikTok. It's, just, it's meant for kids. It's just like TikTok, we're done. But the what I think we have lost is um, transparency uh, and um, 
I called friendship between and time between parents and and children and it's hard because you know you have a you, you have a child and then you have to work all the time and you never get time to actually sit down and know right and for me I think it's really important even with the media literacy training there is the component of parents understanding what content is my child consuming and being aware it's not policing them but having very candid conversations on why certain content should not be believed should not be believed or um, because at the end of the day you don't want to police and take away the opportunity from this child to learn these tools because on the other side it's a powerful tool for that child to express themselves to meet could find opportunities because there are very many things they can do there but now it's really to help you know children understand how like how we do media literacy the digital literacy for kids i think unicef might have i need to double check is to help kids understand these tools better and how to use them for their own good but the conversation has to be there so if we're not talking to the to our kids definitely we'll never know what content they're consuming and if it's bad content it could be pornographic content they will never tell you right so you will just be always at the back with friends so the first part is you know let's really create an environment where you are able to understand what content is being consumed in the house <laughs> so that you can also find a way of of supporting them and then with the media literacy if nawuguzi for example has the opportunity to prepare we have we've had the reason for why it has not worked very successfully it's really financial but we've had to for example curate programs holiday programs where kids come in and get training um but it has not been very effective. What we want to be able to do is to work with even parents to say how can we make sure these trainings are happening? We have the space can come the trainers are here. But at the grassroots level I think for me it's going to be hard to regulate these unless we talk to which is not the best way to go. Regulators around, you know, at that level. <laughs> However, I think DSTV does a good job which we can pick lessons from DSTV in terms of like parental guidance. I'm not a parent so, so I don't have very good examples. <laughs> But DSTV as a as a platform has parental guidance where you can safeguard. So it could be I don't know how that sort of like example could apply on the online platforms. Uh if if is there Facebook for kids? Mm. Well, but there is YouTube for kids for example. I don't know for TikTok. I'm not a good user with that. So YouTube for example has uh, you know you know you can set it up. I've seen even you know people who can afford Netflix now, but it's really hard. So the thing I think for me the best protection is this conversation because that's the first line of defense so that there is trust that my child can confidently come without fear of reprise or you know they know like oh, the conversation is going to happen and it's really based on what content are we consuming is it good for you so media literacy for example we help them understand the thought process behind creating movies so that when they see superman they can try it out but please eh don't do the other <laughs> don't fly over from here right because they need to know that there is uh, there are stunts there is safety already there so if you try it at home and that's really good because then you see kids saying ah so that's what happens ah okay good right they get it so we have one exercise called media machine which you can also try it's the how for them to understand how journalists create content so we create a scene like an accident and some of the kids are policemen others are journalists others are news anchors and they run through the scene so the accident happens the policeman calls the journalist the journalists run with their cameras they cover it they run to the editor's space the editor says oh yeah this is good then they send it to the production room the production kids are like working out then it ends up with a news anchor then the news anchor airs it live and then they are able to see themselves on the screen and that experience they never forget so we find those sort of like role plays and tools to help them understand like what's behind so that they can 
make even for them better decisions. The first part is, can your child make you know a decision for them to say, ah, that's not good content for me. You, you seem to have a, you know. Okay. Oh yeah. Thank you. Okay. For Hello. Me? No, just for you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shamim Nirere. I'm an educator. I would like to build on what you are saying. Part of what we do at Isere Education is um, we ask ourselves what skills should today's children be learning? And then we support schools and also run programs for that. Before I bring uh, a proposal to run that program for you, I would like to just share that uh, what he said is not sustainable to police children today because children, um, for example, born after 2010, they're younger than 3D TV. It's, it's not even their future, it's there now. Facebook is their past, it's for us adults, it's for us grown people, grandmothers. For them, yes, <laughs> so it's, 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 in their, it's their world today. I don't like them. your tone. <laughs> No, I've, I've had teenagers t like roll eyes on you like you're on Facebook, no. So what I'm trying to say is that TikTok is there, is there now, is there present. So what we do is, what I encourage parents to do is like, let's get children to also be part of the people to create content, not just consume. Because children have amazing stories. The stories you tell your children as they go to bed, they can create so many stories, you know. So apart from just being consumers as a continent, they how can create. we control? to creating that content and then we teach young people and children to be responsible online. One of the challenges right now even as adults is managing distractions. There is so much noise that even you as an adult you fail to work because of notifications, because of TV. So there are some things you start with. For example at home you use one gadget at a time even for children. You're either watching TV and that's all. You can't be watching TV. You have a tab, you have a laptop open, you're doing homework and you're eating food. That is recipe for disaster. One of the top skills that needed today is skills of focus. Even for us adults, we are struggling. So you begin small when they are young and you teach them one gadget at a time and responsibility. When they are watching something, ask them what is the PG? If something is PG-13 and my daughter is 10 years, she has no business watching that. In fact, she's the one who keeps checking and saying, ah, mommy, this is PG-11. And you know that it's really, really clean, it's really okay, but because you want to inculcate that skill of saying that I am 10 years, you have no business watching 13-year-old content, they're out. So it has grown and it has become, there's one time we're watching TV together and showed uh, PG-18. It was just something on local TV, very clean. But I said, you know what, you can't watch this. I even didn't watch. So with time, it has reached a point where she, she keeps saying, no, I can't watch this. That is more sustainable because then they are going to regulate themselves. Even if you regulate and police so much, at school they are interacting with children whose parents maybe they don't care and children are consuming adult content. Content. So when they're in that environment, they are so fortified that they're going to say, no, I'm not going to watch that. So it is important what you're doing, getting children to actually be meet media survey and know how the things are done. If, you, if a child, their favorite cartoon is something and you ask them if you are to recreate this script or if you are to recreate this, this movie or this cartoon, how would you do it? And just listen and let them actually create if they can. You are creating that skill. Because the truth is, there are some influencers, most of them, teenage girls, who are earning three million. We don't earn that in offices. Yeah, so it is much. their future. And they are going to earn so much money, but it is, it's just a double-edged sword that we can, our young people can get so many disruptive jobs that wouldn't have been there. They're getting so much money. Or they can just consume and the algorithm set for Africa, you know the content they give us, just entertainment and nothing serious. So it's, it's, we have so much power. And for spaces like yours, you're doing a great job. We'd like just to come and make that work happen. Don't struggle with parents. We have parents. We have communities. Let's run that for you. Hey. Thank you. Clap for her. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, ah, you, are, you, are, you are good. Thank you. Did that help? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Good. 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 Um, the gentlemen seem to be quiet, but they are in the room. Um, <laughs> any questions, observations? I am here. You're doing you're doing a good job, but I feel you need backup. We don't like your tone. <laughs> <laughs>
Andrew, okay. at least someone Andrew? we shall say hey. a happy Women's Day. Huh? Uh, hi everyone. I'm Mark Chris Kaizi. Um, on behalf of the organizers, we apologize for not wishing you a happy Women's Day in advance. <laughs> So um, the conversation is really great and uh, I'm really happy that we are having this and uh, I'm really happy that there is a sort of uh, intergenerational conversation that's going on and that's something that's really important. Uh, so I'll go back tomorrow to all the women, to all the girls, to all the ladies in the hey, poet. That's your... Uh, hey. hey. <laughs> Let me wish you a very happy Women's Day. You are strong. You keep us going. And uh, don't stop pushing those boundaries. And let's keep going. Thank you very much. Tracy, do you want to know why um, men keep silent in conversations about gender? I would really love... Um, yeah. This is and, and honest yeah. space. So yeah. let's go. Let's hear it. So gender and sexual harassment. I mean, especially sexual harassment. Men will always keep quiet. And I think it's it's the same with when we talk about racism and white people. You just it's, it's a, there's always that silence, and sometimes it's like, what do I say, right? Um, and I think there's been that's why you've seen after you know decades of work around gender equality, now organizations like UN Women are beginning to say, you know what, we need now you know, main, male inclusion in uh, these discussions because for some time, I think the men ran away for many, many reasons. But one of the things that I know for sure is that when we have had conversations where we're talking about gender or, you know, gender and sexual uh, violence, men are always silent. And even like the fault of us as people who invite, you fault yourself, you find that all your invited guests are women. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not saying you today, but they, they are, we just need to be aware. And I think for us who work in the media space, it's... Um, when we create spaces and conversations like this, even how do we get men to feel like they have a role to play and a conversation to have um, and not coming into the space from a, like a guilty, already feeling guilty. Um, and even I think on the other side, like panelists and moderators, sometimes we are not very kind to the men in the audience if they say something that we don't believe in, right? So we had one session here where one of the students said, I want to advocate for the boy child, right? <laughs> and um, one of the panelists like just went, ripped this kid apart. This kid is, is at the university. And of course, you expect university. But the idea is, yes, we want, like if you're a feminist and maybe you don't agree with the, this thing where people say the boy child has been left behind, but what's the best way to have this conversation without making the other person feel like you are useless and you shouldn't be talking and this is not your place to be and that I think sort of there are other reasons but one of the th I was just wanting to share that I don't know sir <laughs> they represent us well or not <laughs> hello my name is Herbert uh, I do agree with uh, your name means Abbas Abbas Herbert Abbas you know we, yeah. <laughs> we're good so often spaces such as these are confrontational in nature. They tend to point fingers, they tend to find fault. So it's sometimes hard for us to come into, I had mixed thoughts about coming here, but then because circumstances <laughs> brought me here, right? Uh, but I think it's pleasant for me and for other people out there that we do have more of such conversations and spaces because they are learning curves for us, yeah? Um, sometimes you find yourself um, engaged in a practice uh, that because you've not been told about it, you're continuously doing it without the background knowledge that it's probably affecting someone. For instance, body shaming, right? Our, our community is is big on uh, subconsciously body shaming women. 
man uh, or uh, woman <laughs> man mostly mostly women yeah gundi <laughs> ogeze yeah uh, and um, when you come into spaces like this it's an opportunity for you to listen to persons who have uh, been affected by gender based violence on digital platforms so for me i think if we could have more of the same we would appreciate it i think it's likely an information gap that we need to cover yeah thank you and and you know one of the things that i i realize we never think about so a, a concept like body shaming if you think about it maybe 20 years or 30 years ago where people would just celebrate you know there was no conversation about weight like you've gained weight everyone would be like yo ah african mama and that's like you know and even as a man you know you would just when people said what's your definition of beauty right your brain and the way it was structured was always the curved so there was never this thing you couldn't trace it until now recently now it has become a huge conversation and again when you talk to like the I share this story I used to work with a with a fellowship program so we used to pair one American and one Ugandan two fellows they would work together in an organization so this one guy from Rwanda he started to just send unsolicited messages to the female american co-fellow and um the female came and reported to the administrators and said um my co-fellow this person that i work with is sexually harassing me and so we said oh my god what is happening here what did he do and then this we <laughs> brought them together and we asked the guy so and the guy was like what sexual harassment i didn't even touch I I just I just just to text to text and for him he was he became very rowdy he just was shouting at everyone's like no 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 there's nothing you're going to tell me and uh, when you sit back and argue with this kind of person you realize there's a history that gives them this sort of like thinking that this is there's nothing that wrong they've done and you know when you're having conversations that could change mindset with this kind of person you have to think about where you know the history where this person has come from their values their beliefs and that's how now that conversation is going to go because if you want to prove to him that he's wrong in his mind it's just going and it took time for him at the end of the fellowship after very many conversations that would happen through spaces where the women would share what they are going through within the community then he would get to say ah okay so for him sending messages is his right as well he thinks so there's not turn out your ngamb right this kind of thing so it's the same like there are people that you talk to and they they just keep commenting on weight on bodies and and even when you say ah but that's wrong they say ah go away right and that's that go away seems like ah uh, it's uh, but it's yeah so we need also like and and i think the researchers need to feed into this historical uh context to explain like where some of these things you know come from especially with spaces that are getting to have more of this conversation and transitions from a patriarchal traditional society into now a more inclusive society text you know that time so thank you so much for engaging with us <laughs> uh bobina wants to say her last words she's run out of time so let's give our audience then we shall carry this on thank you for having me thank you for having us be a part of this i unfortunately won't be able to you know talk over cocktails but please reach out to me if you'd like to talk about any of the work we're doing as policy or to reach out at policy as an organization reach out to us we're open door policy really so we're happy to to do the work together um i guess just before i leave i'd like to uh say the reason these spaces feel confrontational is because the gender equality has to do with a power imbalance so the power has been tilted towards one end for so long and so i'd actually like to personally my final remarks to just say 
for the conversations that we're having, like he pointed out, to be able to come in spaces like this and talk about things like gender, sh uh, body shaming, etc. It's because of the work of feminists who have been, you know, talking about these issues for a while and now they're becoming more mainstream, which is great. And uh, it's, I think, just really uh, amazing to know that this could be carried on and, you know, our societies could be more inclusive and just people could live freely, you know, the way they would like to without uh, all these stereotypes and just all these, uh, the burdens that, you know, women have had to bear so long because of the way our society has been set up for so long. And so happy Women's Day to all of you. Happy Women's Day to the women doing the great work. Um, happy Women's Day to the people that are doing the work to uh, make our world uh, a better place for everyone, for all humans and yeah it's really amazing to meet you all and great conversation great meeting you Abbas great meeting you um, as well I'm sorry I have a problem pronouncing it um, it's yeah you know, my bad but no thank you very much for having me here having us a policy be a part of this thank you so much for being around so I think I don't know if there is any other person who wants to share something or maybe we should just break out into the networking session and yeah, drinks. <laughs> he has found it important for me to highlight that. <laughs> is there any other person who wants to share something, ask something? Hi everyone, so my name is Tracy. Um, I feel like when it comes to gender and the very deeply entrenched um, connotations that come with it and the power imbalances that come with it, we often forget the cultural aspects, the norms, uh, where we come from. These do not just start to do when you have Twitter and you have your TikToks. These start from when we were young. Um, you have a neighbor, an uncle, who's like, eh, you know, and, and it's, you, you, you sweep it. It's okay. It's, it's no more. You know, you're growing up. And then it grows. But you see, the boy had that. You had that. Your mom didn't say anything. You didn't say anything. The boy, your cousin had it. We kept quiet. You grow. You reach school. Ah, that chick is a tomboy. Eh? Do you see? Like, she's not like a girl. So those things, we say them, the kids pick, pick it up. They, they are innocent. Right now, there are statements that you will say around, for example, my daughter, and she'll be like, you're rude. You're rude. You just can't call anyone anything. You can't body shame. And she has put this at the back of their mind, right? But as parents, as guardians, as friends, as cousins, there are these things that, you know, you notice even around kids. Hey, you, this and this. And they say them, but they got it from you. They got it from auntie so and so. I think we need to shift, but shift from the grass root. Uh, you know that saying of the, uh, I can't say it in my language, you won't even understand it. But um, a stick is bent when it's still. Yeah, that one. <laughs> I don't know. If I said it, you wouldn't understand. But you need to bend the stick while it's still young. Because once we are grown and we have our accounts, you really can't mess with me. That's what I want to say and that's it. That's I'm, I'm going to say it. But let's start um, now and then probably the next generation will be a little bit more equitable and more sensitive. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being around. For I had the program lined out and we were supposed to have a mental health professional on the panel. But unfortunately, she had to cancel at the last minute. So we agreed that we are going to do a recording. It's, it's not going to be live like this, but we shall have a recording. If you have any questions, I, you can send them through of these conversations that we've had in terms of online gender-based violence, how best you can help yourself mentally to, you know, build the resilience that <laughs> was shut down. But do share the questions. She's going to be able to answer them. It will come out after this session that we've had. Thank you so much. We are now ready to network. There is something to eat at the back and something to drink. 
The event was hugely sponsored by the Media Challenge Initiative. In my deepest of fears and doubts, these people assured me that the event could happen. Policy equally made sure that while we were having a transformational conversation, it would be kind for our attendees to network over some bites and drinks. Mm -hmm. To the individuals that worked heavily to make this day possible. Simon Kakosa of the Media Challenge Initiative, Odwo Jagero of Core Media, Okello Herbert Andrew of Untold Stories Uganda, Alika Kembo of MCI Radio, Zoe Nakuya, Anna Grace Awili, our panelists, Abbas Pindi of the Media Challenge Initiative, and Bobina Zulfa from Policy. And to our live audience, thank you. Thank you so much for turning up. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of Hashtag with Navguzi Chuanka. If you loved what you heard, make sure you subscribe to Hashtag with Navguzi Chuanka in your podcast platform of choice and share it with your friends, loved ones, and everyone that you believe is affected by the millennial world around us. If anything resonated with you during our conversation, do not hesitate to share with us on social media. We are at Hashtag with Navguzi Chuanka on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter. Our handle is at HTNK podcast. See you next week. Bye.